الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى الكريم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى أصحابه الصالحين الصادقين What I'm, I'm going to try and do in this session of uh, inshallah between 45 and 60 minutes is to take us through some of the dimensions of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Which uh, I personally feel haven't been given enough attention to when we reflect upon the martyrdom, the events of Karbala, the tragedy, but also the mystery. And it's the dimensions of love, of even beauty, pertaining to that mystery of the sacrifice that I'm intending to speak about tonight. When Imam Ali salam came to the land named Karbala, he asked what it was called. And when he was told, this is Karbala, he said, this is the land of the Oshaq and the Shuhada, the lovers and those who bear witness. The Shuhada, plural of Shaheed, we're all aware of. We understand that this was a kind of prophecy Imam Ali was telling his people that some earth-shattering event would take place here and it would be a place where the lovers and the witnesses in English when we talk about the martyr we're saying exactly the same thing using the Greek etymology of that word the martyr is the one who bears witness with his life or her life and the shaheed of course has exactly the same double connotation bearing witness but dying for the sake of that testimony of that to which one is bearing witness why did he say the Oshaq, the lovers that's something that I want to investigate tonight why did he refer to the martyrs of Karbala in a prophecy with the word lovers this is directly connected I believe with what the sister of Imam Hussein, Hazrat Zainab salam, said when in the court of Yazid, after giving her famous speech against the tyrant and against what had been done to her brother and his companions, she added this sentence that was very, very penetrating and, as I say, mysterious. She said, I saw nothing but beauty. Despite the fact that you people slaughtered my brother, my relatives, companions, I saw nothing there but beauty. Outwardly it was a massacre, outwardly it was a series of murders, 73 men against an army of thousands, between four and seven thousand, but inwardly, Hazrat Zainab salam, is telling us that what she saw was something very beautiful. Ma ra'aytu illa jamila, she said. How can we understand what happened on Karbala as something beautiful? That's the question we should ask ourselves. A simple answer to that question is to say that it was beautiful because the Qur'an refers to sabr, to patience, as being beautiful. Thank you very much. Hazrat Yaqub says sabrun jamil. Patience is beautiful. Therefore, when one's thinking of 
the patience, the fortitude, the perseverance, the, the steadfastness, all of which is included in this idea of sabr. A simple answer is to say that the martyrs of Karbala manifested a patience in the face of adversity which was uplifting and inspiring and beautiful to behold. And here to understand that the reason why patience in the spiritual sense and not just the moral sense is beautiful, we can go to another verse of the Holy Quran which is verses 153 to 157 in the Surah Al-Baqarah which relates the Shahada, the beauty of patience, the power of prayer and the inevitability of sacrifices that all of us will be called upon to make at some stage in our lives. In these verses of the Surah Al-Baqarah we read أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة O oh, ye who believe seek help in patience and prayer Here we have patience allied to prayer which is a fundamental relationship There can be no authentic sabr without that vertical relationship with God. Wasbir, the Prophet is told, be patient, but you cannot be patient except through God. Wasbir wa ma sabruka illa billah. So this is the first part of the verse. We're told that the patience, the steadfastness, the fortitude comes through its alliance with a spirit of prayer. And then we're told, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ Don't say that those who are killed in the path of God are dead. بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ Nay, they are alive, but they, you do not perceive it. The martyrs are therefore alive in the spiritual sense. Those who have been slain materially in the path of God. وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ But you do not perceive it. Then we're told about what this means for us who have not necessarily been slain and may not be slain in the path of God but we all have to show patience in the face of adversities as we get taken through a series of trials. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْسِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ You'll be tried with something of fear and hunger and loss of life and loss of the fruits of your labor. What and the fruits of your labor. But then we're told, Sabirin, but give good news, happy news to the patient. The patience here is now linked to what we had at the beginning of the passage. Sabirin. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُمْ مُصِيبَتُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Truly, these are the ones who say, when they're afflicted with a problem, they say, we belong to God and we are returning to Him. These are the ones, according to the Qur'an, upon whom there are blessings from God and mercy from God and they are the rightly guided. Now the word here is salawatun, blessings that are the divine descent of that rain of barakah that was referred to at the beginning when we are told to seek patience in prayer and in patience. Our ability to seek this vertical dimension, to seek the quality of the divine, will be impacted upon us in the form of patience in the face of adversity. These are the ones who will have mercy and blessings from their Lord. These are the ones who are rightly guided. Now we can't understand the sacrifice of Imam Hussein without understanding the particular role played by this Salat 
the prayer that we've been talking about in these verses. The night before Karbala, he tells the opposing army that we want one night before we start fighting. Please give us one night where we can do ibadah, where we can pray. And then he says, my Lord knows that I have always loved to perform the prayer. I've always loved to recite the Quran. I've always loved to make supplication, dua and to do istighfar, seeking God's forgiveness. Now Imam Hussein, according to Zain al-Abidin said that his father performed in the course of 24 hours 1,000 units of prayer. These units of prayer performed by day and by night meant that Imam Hussein was prayer personified. He did not need to perform one more night of prayer before his martyrdom. What he was saying was that we need to do that for the sake of which we were created. The Quran tells us that God created us only in order to worship Him. So it's as if Imam Hussein is saying at the eve of the battle that he wants to make a strong symbolic statement that what we will do for this night in preparation for our death is what every one of us should be doing as human beings in accordance with the creative intention of our Lord. This is further reinforced when on the field of battle when half of his companions have already died the time for the Dhuha prayer comes and he insists on praying the Salat al Khawf, the prayer that you perform in times of danger. The Umayyad army would not allow him to do that. So he had two companions standing to keep guard. They were shot to pieces by the time the prayer was finished. But on the field of battle, it's as if he is saying, this prayer is the reason why I am refusing to put my hand into the hand of Yazid. This prayer that symbolizes the religion and this religion that Yazid is in the process of dismantling and destroying. And here we have the answer to the question that was put to Zain al-Abidin in Medina when he was tauntingly asked by people in Medina who was the victor, who won, who was the ghalib at Karbala. And the Imam said back to this person, wait until the time for the next prayer comes, listen to the azan, and then perform the prayer, that will be your answer to the question. In other words, the call to prayer, the mentioning of Allah, of the Messenger, inviting people to pray, and then the performance of the prayer itself shows that the victor at Karbala was Imam Hussein salam, and the religion of Islam. The prayer being the perfect, the most complete symbol of the entire religion. That is the purpose for us as human beings and that's the purpose of Islam. To teach us how to pray, how to worship God and how to conform the whole of our life to that worship. Vertical dimension of prayer, horizontal dimension of justice. Both of these dimensions were what Yazid was wishing to undermine. He had no interest in social or political justice. He had no interest in the prayer. But we can ask the question, why is it that Imam Hussein salam, refused to put his hand into the hand of Walid ibn Utbah, the governor of Medina, when he came in the middle of the night, having been told that Muawiyah has passed away, there's a new caliph in Damascus, come and make your allegiance to him. And he refused. When he gave his speech of refusal, what did he say? He said, I am the representative of the Ahl al-Bayt, the household of prophecy, the place of mercy, of wisdom. How can the likes of me make 
an oath of allegiance to the likes of Yazid, who is not only an oppressor, he is also a drinker of wine and a murderer. Now, we all know that the policies of Yazid's father, Muawiyah, were not so very different from the policies of Yazid. But the difference between the two is that Muawiyah attempted to uphold the appearances, the formal principles of Islam, whereas Yazid trampled those principles underfoot. So for Imam Hussein to make allegiance to Yazid would be tantamount to endorsing a way of life and not simply a political leader. And that way of life was one in which wine was being openly consumed, dancing girls and apes and dogs were being brought into court to be trained up as pastimes for these people in Damascus. Now it's very interesting and important to note that before Yazid became Caliph, he went to Medina. And in the streets of Medina, he was drunk with his entourage. And he tauntingly said to Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, come and have a drink. Join me for a drink of wine. Imam Hussein refused. Muawiyah said, how? And then he gave a poem on the spot. He was renowned as a poet, Yazid. And he composed a poem right there, saying, how can you refuse a drink of wine from a cup on which sits the lip of the master of the Arabs? Referring to himself, prematurely saying, I am as it were the master of the Arabs. And he says to Imam Hussein, the dancing girl has caught your heart, has captured your heart, and she does not regret it. So he's taunting the Imam, and Imam Hussein replies by saying simply, Qalbuk, your heart, O Yazid. And he moves away. Imam Hussein knew exactly what kind of person Yazid was, and how this wine drinking was a symbol of the undermining of the Islamic principles of propriety. And it's also very eloquent a symbol, for it's a kind of seeking of intoxication, which is the very opposite of the prayer. Just as the prayer symbolizes the whole of Islam vertically and horizontally, the drinking of wine symbolizes the destruction of Islam vertically and horizontally. If you undermine something so fundamental as the prohibition on wine, you undermine everything. But on top of it, you ignore the whole panoply of prayer which brings you into relationship with your Lord. So it's basically two types of intoxication we're talking about. Intoxication through wine, which is an escape from reality to illusion or the intoxication of prayer, of the remembrance of God, which is an escape from illusion to spiritual reality. A spiritual reality which is beautiful, which is loving, and which gives you everything that you're seeking in your false attempt to be intoxicated through wine. This is what explains the night worship of the Imam and of the Blessed Prophet Dajjad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We cannot understand how our great Ahlul Bayt, how they could stand in, night, in prayer for hours and hours and hours unless we understand that they are engaging in an act of making beautiful. Ihsan, which the Prophet ﷺ said is that you should worship God as if you could see Him. And if you cannot see Him, He can see you. Now what is it that the Prophet is seeing that sustains his worship? What is it that the Imams are seeing that sustains these thousands of rakats that they perform in prayer every night? They are not seeing some abstract 
philosophical principle. They're seeing the divine beauty. Inna Allah jamilun wa yuhibbul jamal. Truly, God is beautiful and He loves beauty. This vision of the Beloved is what our Blessed Prophet وسلم, and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, are perceiving when they perform their worship. If we don't understand this, we will not understand why it is that Imam Hussein should put so much stress on the prayers the night preceding his martyrdom and on the prayers that he insisted on performing on the field of Karbala halfway through the battle, the Dhoha prayer. It's because he's saying this beauty that I see in my prayer empowers me to make the sacrifice that I'm making now. This beauty that I see in my prayer, that the Prophet told me to see. When the Prophet was asked, what is Islam? He gave the, the acts, the various pillars of Islam. When he's asked, what is Iman? He said what you should believe in. God, the angels, the prophets, the scriptures, and so on. But then the third question, what is Ihsan? Ihsan is not simply virtue or excellence. Ihsan is literally making beautiful. He was asked, how do you make beautiful your action and your thought through identifying your being with the Absolute? And the answer that he gave was that you should worship God as if you could see Him. How do they come to see God who is above and beyond all physical perception? Here we look to what Imam Ali says salam, who tells us that the eyes cannot see God but the hearts can see God. La tudrikuhul oyun bi mushahadatil ayyan walakin tudrikuhul bulu bi haqaiq al iman. The eyes see God not according to outward perception, but the hearts see God according to the spiritual realities of faith. That is the vision that the Imam had and which he refers to as a possibility for everybody and not just the Prophets and the Imams. Because he talks about the eye of the heart opening up through dhikrullah, through the remembrance of God. Doing so in relation to the verse which comes right after the ayat al nur That verse that talks about Rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wa la bay'un an dhikrillah. People who are not distracted from their remembrance of God by trade and merchandise. They carry out all of their daily activities but they always are in a state of remembrance of God. How do they attain this practice? The Imam tells us. How do they attain that vision? Through the practice of dhikrullah, the remembrance of God. Where he says, Inna Allah ja'ala a dhikr jila'an lil qulub. Truly, God has made the dhikr a polish for the heart. Why do we not see God with our heart? Because the Quran tells us, Bal rana ala qulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. The rust of our bad actions has covered over our heart. Our bad actions result in a rust over our heart. So when we look there, we see no reflection of the divine beauty. So the dhikrullah in all its forms, invocation of the name of God, recitation of the Holy Qur'an, supplication through du'a, seeking of istighfar, a salat ala nabi, all of these are forms of dhikrullah, all of them polish the heart. Enabling the heart to see, according to Imam Ali in this sermon, 213 of the natural balagha. To see after being blind, to hear after being deaf, to yield after being resistant. These become possibilities for each and every one of us.
to enable us to glimpse something of the beauty of the divine reality. This reality is not some abstract principle that we just die for as a conviction or a belief, but we're dying for the Beloved. In the Surah Al-Insan, which directly relates to the Ahl al-Bayt, I'm sure most of you know that the Ahl al-Bayt fasted for three consecutive nights, and each night someone more needy came in need of food. They gave their food and went hungry for three nights. And what do they say to the miskeen, to the yatim, to the asir? Innama nut'inukum li wajhillah la nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. We feed you for the sake of the face of God. The face of God, not just lillah, li wajhillah. For the sake of God, we don't desire from you any thanks, any reward. The same idea is expressed at the end of the Surah Al-Layl, إِلَّا بْتِغَى أَوَجْهِ رَبِّهِ الْأَعْلَى The Atqa, the most pious, avoids the fire, who gives his wealth to purify himself, to come closer to his Lord, and he's seeking the face of God only. Now what is this face of God that the Prophet and the Imams see? through their dhikrullah, through their oneness with prayer. They are seeing a face which, if we were to imagine lying in our beds and looking up to the ceiling above us and suddenly we see the most beautiful face that we've ever seen before and we fall in love with that face and the more we look at it, the more we contemplate it we see that in that face, all of the people that we love are manifested, are evoked. We can see something of our mother, our father, our brother, our sister, as well as anyone that we ever loved. It's all there in that one face. And then we have to multiply the beauty of that all-inclusive face, which takes away from any kind of physical desire which gives you a pure spiritual bliss at merely contemplating that face. We have to multiply the beauty that we perceive in that face by a million times in order to understand something of the beauty that the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt saw with the eye of their heart. An essence which contains all conceivable beauty and transcends all conceivable beauty. That is not an abstraction. They are praying in gratitude for what they've received. They see that all the lower delights of this world, whatever carnal union in sexuality that gives a person ecstasy, ecstasy literally means coming out of yourself, that ecstasy that is possible through sexual union is a tiny fraction of the experience of spiritual intoxication that is given to our prophets and our imams through the vision of God. And so because of that vision, they express gratitude. This is a consummation of pure love in their worship. This is why Imam Ali says, alayhi salam, a group of people worship God out of fear and they are the slaves. A group of people worship God out of desire and they are the merchants. But the ones who worship God out of shukr are the ones who are the liberated. They're liberated from fear and desire. They are only receiving this vision through the intensity and the profundity and the beauty of their prayer so that nothing of this world can possibly compete in value or attachment to that attachment that they have to that supreme value which is the divine beauty. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked by his wife, Sayyidatha Aisha radiallahu anha, why don't you come to bed? You have been praying hour after hour after hour so that your feet are swollen, come to bed. 
he turns to her and says, Am I not a grateful slave? And that image is a very powerful one of the Prophet preferring to stay for hours in prayer rather than go to bed with his only virginal wife that he married in his whole life. There is a mode of ecstasy, a mode of love, a mode of beauty that we cannot understand unless we see that it's out of gratitude for the gift that they're receiving. And we can't understand their capacity to sacrifice themselves for that beauty unless we understand this principle of divine love and beauty being at the heart of worship. In the Surah Al-Insan, we're also told that the Ahl al-Bayt are the slaves of God. They are the Ibadullah. In the Surah, which is directly revealed on the occasion when they fasted three nights and gave their food away to the poor, the beginning of the Surah tells us that the Abrar, the righteous, drink. Inna al-Abrara yashrabuna min katsin kana mizajuha kafura. The righteous drink from a cup that is flavored with the celestial fountain of Kafur. Aynan yashrabu biha ibadullah yufajirunaha tafjira. This is a fountain from which the slaves of God drink, making the fountain flow with all the greater abundance, all the more copiously. In other words, this celestial wine, which is also described as Ma'in in the Surah Al-Waqi'ah, as Tasneem in the Surah Al-Mutaffifin, and also as Sal Sabil in the same Surah Al-Insan, we have different references to these fountains that produce wine in paradise, which helps us to see that there is nothing intrinsically wrong with wine on earth. It's just that we are becoming capable of being true to the celestial character, the celestial soul that can imbibe the wine and be intoxicated spiritually. We now get intoxicated the wrong way. So these wines of paradise that give you spiritual intoxication are so many symbols for the kinds of worship that the pure slaves of God have on earth. And they drink this wine and the more they drink, the more it flows with abundance. Meaning that they are absolutely identified with those celestial sources of intoxication. Their very presence becomes a radiation of the intoxication that they are receiving through their adoration. That becomes a concrete reality, which is why we feel the hujja, the proof of sanctity, coming through these people. They drink, but the rest of us, we drink from a cup with a few drops of kafur. We cannot take that strong drink, that deep worship, that's referred to in terms of that fountain. So we drink something flavoured from it. <coughs> Imam Hussein tells us, alayhi salam, that the face of God that he sees is of course the result of this intoxication with beauty. But he also tells us that the people of this earth will pass away. In the Ahl al Ard Yamutun. Then he says the Ahl al Sama La Yabkun. Even the people in paradise will not persist. They will go on forever. The only thing that persists eternally is the face of God, the Wajhullah. This face, which is the eternal Ridwan. Because if the Imam is here talking about the people of paradise not persisting, and that the face of God alone is eternal, then he's indirectly saying that paradise has an end. 
It's a very profound statement that he's making. Because we're told in the Surat Hud, Surah number 11, at verse 108, we're told that hell will persist for as long as the heavens and the earth go on except as your Lord wills. Then it says exactly the same thing about paradise. The people who are blessed in paradise will remain therein and then it says a gift never to be cut off. So paradise comes to an end because God alone is eternal. But the paradisal state, the condition of bliss, is only absorbed into a higher degree of bliss. And that is the Ridwan, the supreme love and beatitude that is Allah Ta'ala's own essence which in the Qur'an is referred to as that which goes beyond paradise, which is greater than paradise. And that's what Imam Hussein is indirectly referring to when he says that everything on this earth and in the heavens comes to an end, but the face of God's beauty alone subsists forever, and it's in that eternal beauty that all of us will be reabsorbed in paradise, and all of us can be reabsorbed even now, because... According to his father's teaching, the hearts of the awliya are already in paradise. In two places in the Natural Balagha, Imam Ali says this. The qulub of the awliya, the arwah of the awliya, the spirits or the hearts of the saints are already in paradise even while they are alive in this world. Their bodies, Imam Ali says, are at work in this world, but their hearts are already in paradise. That vision that they enjoy of paradise is the vision of beauty that enables them to sacrifice themselves for that religion, that law, which contains the law of love, which contains the spirit of intoxication and the spirit of salvation through that potential intoxication. These are the kinds of relationships I think we should bear in mind when we think about why it is that Imam Hussein should have put so much stress in the making of his sacrifice, why he should put so much stress on the performance of the prayer at every possible opportunity. Imam Ali talks about the wine in question. He says, truly God has a drink for his friends, a drink for his awliya. When they drink it, they are intoxicated, sakaru. When they are intoxicated, they are enraptured, tarabu. When they are enraptured, they become blessed, tabu. When they're blessed, they dissolve. Dhabu. When they're dissolved, they become pure or free. Khalasu. When they become pure, free, they devote themselves sincerely. Akhlasu. When they've devoted themselves sincerely, then they seek. This is a very important part of the saying. This talab. It says talabu. The real seeking of God can only come subsequent to this liberation, this purification, this dissolution, this intoxication, and so on. That we have these stages of ibadah which come through drinking this drink. We are drinking it through the cup flavored with tasneem, flavored with kafur, with salsabil. But eventually, we join the ranks of the true worshippers, the saints and the prophets, by God's grace. But this talab is all important in the same here. Then they seek. Then they have real talab for God. And when they have talab, of course they find. Wajadu. When they find, 
they arrive. Wasal. When they arrive, they are at one. Ittasal. And when they are at one, Imam Ali says, السلام, there is no difference between them and their beloved. And now we come, after talking about this mystical union, we come back to the sacrifice at Karbala, the slaying that took place, that Hazrat Zainab السلام, referred to as beauty. She was seeing what took place with the eye of the heart that could see the fruit of this martyrdom even while it was happening. And one cannot help thinking of the Blessed Virgin, Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam, at the foot of the cross as she sees Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam being crucified. Um, the great Christian mystic that Dr. Nam Azikhar referred to, Meister Eckhart, in his introduction. This great Christian mystic says that even at the foot of the cross, the Blessed Virgin was able to look at the crucifixion and inwardly be in a state of immutable beatitude, immutable joy at the vision of the reality above and beyond the suffering of the cross. That's what Hazrat Zainab is saying about the field of Karbala. She's seeing the fruit in this seed of outward suffering. She's seeing the inward invisible fruit, but to the eye of her heart, it's visible. It's the reality of God taking to Himself these martyrs in a mode which is upholding the religion, showing the oppressors that the religion cannot be crushed and undermined, destroyed by one oppressive ruler. This act of sacrifice is a slaying from an outward point of view, but it is sacrifice which in the literal meaning of the word means making sacred. You are making sacred when you make a sacrifice. Sacra, and then this F-I-C-E refers to the root in Latin, to make. You are making sacred through your sacrifice. Now what is it that you are making sacred? You are making sacred ultimately your own soul, as well as providing sanctity, the means of sanctity for all of the people who will identify with your sacrifice. Now the two things with which I will conclude. One is a saying of Imam Ali salam, and the second, actually I will go to the second and then come back to this saying of Imam Ali. That for the sake of which Imam Hussein died was not simply the law of Islam that said prohibit alcohol. When he emphasized the prayer, the prayer was the symbol, the most important practical pillar of the religion. That practical pillar of religion is told, is, is given to us, presented to us in the hadith which most explicitly defines walaya. The walaya of the Imams, the walaya which is the batin of Nubuwa. When Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Hadith Qudsi that my slave comes closer to me by nothing that I love more than what I have made obligatory upon him. Now you have to think what that means, that what I've made obligatory is the faraid, the basic acts, the pillars, the arkan, the da'a'im, whatever one wants to call them. The fasting, the prayer, the zakat, the pilgrimage to Mecca once in one's lifetime, if one can, and the testimony. But Imam Jafar says the most important of these uh, da'a'im of Islam is the walaya, because it's the walaya that is engaging directly with mahabba. Imam Jafar simply says, al-walaya al-mahabba. What is walaya? It is love. And that is to be taken in the context of this saying, Hadith Qudsi, that God says, my slave comes closer to me by nothing that I love more than what I have made obligatory upon him. The faraid. And out of the faraid, it's the prayer, 
that is the one that we enact daily. So God is saying He loves nothing more than the prayer by means of which you come close to God and by means of which you understand and realize the truth and the love of your worship, of your beloved. Then, in the second part of the Hadith Qudsi, we're told that the slave continues to come closer to God through the Nawafil. And those Nawafil, all of the extra prayers, the Dhikr Allah, the Awrad, the Adhkar, the Istighfar, the recitation of the Qur'an. And we're told then that, that when the slave comes so close to God through the extra supererogatory prayers, such that God comes to love him, God says, then I am his hearing by which he hears, his sight by which he sees, his hand by which he smites, the foot whereupon he walks. So we've gone from the first stage, the legal minimum, which God loves nothing more than, to the second stage, which is spiritual intoxication that we're talking about with Imam Ali saying. They are one with their Lord. There is no difference. They have attained true Tawheed, not Ittihad, which is the bringing together of two different things, but Tawheed, which is the realization of the actual oneness, the true oneness of what appears to be multiple, differentiated. So God is saying that He loves the ropes of salvation that He has led down from heaven to earth by means of which we can climb from earth to heaven. He loves nothing more than that because He is looking at those acts of worship with the same spiritual, metaphysical, divine vision of seeing the consequences in the causes. The cause of coming close to God is the prayer. The consequence of coming close to God is the consummation of love and beauty. So God can love nothing more than that union, being one with Himself. Therefore, He loves those fara'id more than anything else. Though that love is identical to the love that He has when He loves the slave who has become a waliullah, a saint, through the nawafir. Because when I love Him, that love is, of course, identical to the love that he has for the first stage, the fara'id. So when we talk about Imam Hussein sacrificing himself as the waliullah par excellence for the sake of God, for the sake of religion, for our sakes, right here and now, to ensure that the religion of Islam would be upheld in its essentials, what we're talking about is a gift of walaya a gift of spiritualization, of intoxication of all of us as a potentiality. That's what's embedded in the very core of our religious practices. If we open our eyes to it and move away from the idea of the Sharia simply being acts of mechanical obedience. Instead, they're acts of love making. You are making love with your Lord in a way that goes beyond the carnal level, beyond the body, beyond any passion, pure contemplation, union in your vision of the beauty of the Lord. Now that union cannot come about without your death. You have to die, not necessarily on the field of Karbala as a martyr, not necessarily by the sword of an oppressor, but you have to die to your egotism to your vanity, to your conceit, to all the things that prevent you from realizing true worship. That is the death of the ego, the fana, that is a prerequisite for these degrees of higher realization of Tawheed. And that's why Imam Ali says, in this remarkable saying, with which I will finish, he tells us that and it's almost like a prophecy of what would happen to his son. He says that Allah Ta'ala, when he speaks in the first person, Hadith Qudsi, he says, He who seeks me, finds me. Remember this is God speaking. Whoever seeks me, Imam Ali says, finds me. Whoever finds me, knows me. 
Whoever knows me, loves me. Whoever loves me, I love him. He whom I love, I slay, I kill. And he whom I kill, I must requite. I have to give the recompense, the dia, the blood wit. And he who I must requite, I am the requiter. In other words, God is saying, in the saying of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, that God himself takes the place of the martyr. He becomes one with the spirit of the martyr in a way that is the highest tawheed. It's not ittihad of two different things becoming one. It's the realization that God alone is. And the revelation of that reality is brought about through the death of the individual. The death of the egotism of the individual. This is what is symbolized in the saying, by the slaying, by the killing. That you cannot attain the truth of worship, the love of union, insofar as you are still attached to your egotism, to your vanity. This is one of the great challenges that I believe Imam Hussein Islam is making to every one of us here today that the religion for the sake of which he sacrificed himself was a religion which contains this sanctification as a potentiality, a potentiality which we can make actual in the measure that we undergo voluntarily what Rumi calls the voluntary return as opposed to the compulsory one. We voluntarily undergo the return to God which is the destruction, the death the annihilation of our egotism. And without that annihilation, there is no possible realization. That is one of the spiritual mysteries, I believe, that Imam Hussein is giving us a mystery of irfan, a mystery of love, a mystery of beauty, and the mystery of spiritual victory, even in the very teeth of an apparent defeat, an apparent defeat on the worldly plane. But we should welcome the defeat, the, what Rumi also calls in the Masnavi, the slaying, the smiting of the neck of the false warrior by the true sword of Hilm. Which Imam Ali, which he, he gives a story which all of you know of Imam Ali refusing to kill Abdul Wad. When he had him on the ground, he sheathed his sword, refused to kill him when... Abdul Wad spat in his face. Rumi makes a wonderful account of that, saying that the reason why it was impossible for the Imam to kill this man was because of that trace of something of himself that came, an anger for a moment, and he had to withdraw, because he said, I am the Lion of God. That Lion of God, according to Rumi says, is the one who slays his own nafs al-Ammara with the sword of Hill, with the sword of Rahmah, with the sword of loving, beauty and compassion of our Lord God. Now, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking more than my time, so I'll just end here and thank you all very much for your patience. And I'm sorry that I ended up speaking completely in English with nothing of the Persian that Dr. Namazi Khab promised. Thank you for, all, for being so attentive. Bye.